Professor Wall is the author of Children's Rights, Today's Global Challenge, Roman and Littlefield 2016, a systematic exploration of the global children's rights movement in its theoretical, historical, and practical complexity, and an argument that children's rights are the major human rights challenge of the 21st century. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor John Wall. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to uh, Muna Kenton and the uh, Cambridge Public Library for inviting me to come and talk today about, about my uh, book from uh, last year. Um, I'm also very impressed by the advertising for this talk that I almost fell over when I saw the chalk uh, writing about it. Uh, what I at first thought was a competing talk on children's rights tonight, but it turned out to be mine, so I'm very happy. <laughs> and I, whoever did that, I wanted Anyway, um, thank you for that uh, welcome. Yes, I, I want to talk about the, uh, give the, an overview of children's rights. Um, and I'm delighted to, to see so many children here, actually. Uh, that doesn't often happen in my talks. Um, I hope it's not too boring for, for you. Um, but I also want to advance this argument that uh, was just suggested, that um, I, do, I do believe, after uh, working for 10 or 15 years on issues of children's rights, that they, they really are the, the major human rights um, challenge of the 21st century. So hopefully by the end of the evening I'll have convinced you of that. Um, but I'm going to start with a, a pop quiz. I'm going to give you a few pop quizzes throughout the, the, the talk, just to, just because of the evening to keep it away. I wonder if anyone can tell me what percentage of the world population is women. In the back. 746%. Anyone know the percentage? Okay, 55. Any other guesses? 50. 50, okay. What about men? What would you guess? A little bit below. Okay. Well, here tonight to reveal to you the answers. If, if I'd asked how many, what's the percentage of females in the world population, then yes, there's slightly more females than males. But, <clears throat> but, but unless you count my three-year-old daughter as a woman, um, your, the breakdown's actually more like this. And I, I, I give you that pop quiz to just illustrate one of the ways that I, as well, and many others, um, sort of write children out of the public discourse. A concept like women hold a part of the sky, well, it should be a third, which is a lot still, but um, we need to think about the three-thirds of the population in, the, in this kind of world. Um, th that's one of the problems that um, makes it important to talk about children's rights. Here are two or three other examples of problems. Um, poverty, uh, children under 17 are the, the poorest of these three groups of people in the world, and Generally speaking, the younger you are, the poorer you, the poorer you get. Um, Health care, if you think about it, the children are the only group in the United States who are actually systematically prevented from getting health care because of our system. Education, 58 million children around the world between the ages of 6 and 11 are not enrolled in any form of schooling whatsoever. And 63 million between the ages of 12 to 15. Um, you could also look at labor exploitation because of globalization, which children are impacted by profoundly. Uh, refugee issues, which I'll, also, I'll talk about a little bit later on as well. Um, and political voice. Do, do children have a real political voice or, or not? And I'll, talk, I'll, give some, I'll talk a little bit about that. But this is not um, a depre meant, meant to be a depressing or negative talk. This is, Half of the talk is about problems, but the other half is about possibilities. And I want to read the first couple of paragraphs from my book to illustrate that. And in hopes of enticing you to buy a copy at some point. Uh, Tazim Ali is the nine-year-old president 
of the Children's Parliament in the ancient limestone city of Varanasi, India. Here's a picture of it. The Children's Parliament started in the 1990s and meeting every Sunday has succeeded in changing local laws on a variety of issues such as lack of accessible health services, police brutality, sexual abuse by teachers, harassment of girls, street lighting, and much else in, in their town. He was elected for a one-year term and has become known across Varanasi for quickly responding to calls on his cell phone and pressuring the city's adult politicians to act. Quote, I was called recently because a two-year-old girl didn't have enough food. She ended up dying, he said. We can get people to pay attention to us. We brought the case to the police. They saw we were serious and didn't want to turn away children. Like children in the 30 or so other countries around the world that have children's parliaments, Ali and his fellow elected parliamentarians are showing that given the chance, young people are able to stand up for their rights and make a difference. Other possibilities are things like children organizing um, to, to combat global warming, uh, youth fighting for gun rights in our own country, young people organizing labor unions around the world, um, young people standing up for, their, for education reform, civil freedoms, and lots of other kinds of uh, issues. Uh, my work is in part based in childhood studies, um, which is a, a relatively new effort in this country to uh, try to understand children as agents in their lives with voices and uh, the capacity to, to make contributions uh, to, to their societies. And it's not uh, against uh, development of psychology, but the idea is to try to think about children as not just developing into adults, but actually complex and, and diverse members of society in their own right, regardless of that. So that's another idea, set of uh, promise that we could look at. Um, but just globally speaking, there's, in my opinion, a rising children's rights movement, which you see little bits of here and there, including the part on uh, youth and others, gradually, in very early stages, forming um, this kind of notion, this cultural shift towards the idea that young people can, in fact, uh, have an important voice in, in their societies. So I'm, I'm going to, to, tonight, just unpack all of that in, in different ways. First of all, theoretically, to think about how can we understand what it means for children to have rights. Second, historically, to, to look back at what the development has actually been and where we are and why we're here. And then I will look at some examples, um, specifically in labor rights, uh, voting rights, and the border situation of last summer. I'll just say a couple of words about that. Um, okay, so on the level of theory, uh, my training is in theory, so um, I'm comfortable on this on this level in, in some ways, but um, uh, it's. I'd like to make the argument that um, the, the 300 year history of theorizing and thinking about children's rights has been what you could call profoundly adultist, you know, or even profoundly patriarchal, if we understand the patriot to be not just male but adult at the same time. Um, and so the, the theoretical challenge is, is very difficult. We have to, to almost completely unpack the whole idea of rights that the modern era has given to us. Um, so, if we go back to some of the great thinkers who, who generated what we think of as rights today, we, they all, in fact, many of them, uh, had a lot of things to say about children, and, and yet, in every case, they all said, children are the last group who should ever have any rights. And, and so, they theoretically constructed rights as an adult sphere, and of course, a white European male uh, sphere as well. But specifically, they had a lot of interest in children. So, for example, John Locke, who's not pictured here, but uh, was one of the inspirations of what's pictured here, which is the Declaration of Independence, um, argued that what a right is is a way for individuals to preserve their own self-interests in society. 
we talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of property uh, as the main interest that people have rights to pursue. And then he wrote extensively about children in lots of his writings to argue that they shouldn't have rights because they don't know how to pursue their self-interests in a rational way. They're still developing rationality. And if they were given the rights to pursue their own interests, they would only hurt themselves and hurt other people at the same time. So for example, John Locke will probably say that Tazi Ali shouldn't have the right to lead a children's parliament because he doesn't know really what's in his own best interest or that of his citizens. And I think you can hear echoes of that language in conversations we still have about children's rights. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was another founding figure in the development of modern rights. He had a slightly different idea about them, which is that their freedoms to participate in uh, the social contract or the formation of the general will in a society. Um, and he also wrote a lot about children, um, not just in Emile, but in lots of his, in his political books as well. And he also said that therefore children should definitely not have any rights, but for a slightly different reason, which is that he thought they should be preserved in a sphere of private innocence for as long as possible, that their childhoods should be preserved, so that they're not corrupted by the world around them, uh, and they can therefore grow up to be healthy, rational citizens. In fact, democracy depends on not letting children grow, which is ironic when you think of it. So Tazim Ali, for example, uh, should be protected from what he's doing, so that he doesn't get lose his innocence in, in the process of doing it. And finally, another major thinker, probably the most influential one, is Immanuel Kant. And he argued that the purpose of having rights in a society is to protect individuals' dignity as autonomous or self-ruling agents in society. And um, again, he wrote about children. And his very last book that he wrote before he died and didn't publish was called Education. Uh, it was all about childbearing. And, um, <coughs> His argument was a little more complicated. He thought that children should be protected against the irrational or partial uh, or violent impulses of the people around them, but they're not impartial or rational enough to, to shape what a right is. So they shouldn't actively, public and, uh, actively participate in public life, but they should nevertheless be protected from other people's ways of participating. So someone like Tazim Ali, for example, would be just thought, well, he can't possibly be partial enough about weighing everybody's interests in this situation because he hasn't overcome his sort of immediate childlike wants and needs and desires that, that he'd, he'd want to impose on everyone. Um, so, you know, if they're the architects, and they are those three main architects of the entire edifice of modern rights, and all of them feel that what they're doing is creating an edifice for adults only, then we have a problem when we want to talk about children's rights. We have to, I don't know if we have to tear the whole edifice down, but we do have to deconstruct it in some way and build, make it wider or dig, dig its foundation deeper or do something different. Um, otherwise, children are always going to be uh, second-class citizens on this foundation that we've got. Um, indeed, the foundation really is suggesting, ultimately, that to be human is to no longer be childlike in, in society. Which is, you know, it's interesting. Um, contemporary rights theorists, I'm, I'm sort of sad to say, have not really gone much further than any of this. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's been three basic strategies for dealing with this underlying problem when it comes to applying the concept of rights to children. And the one that is by far the most common is to simply say that, okay, yes, children do deserve some rights, but only partial rights around the edges. You can give them a little bit of uh, this. <coughs> and I would include everybody from John Rawls to Jürgen Habermas to Martha Nussbaum, uh, all the big uh, theorists of, of human rights uh, today and, and recently um, in, in that category. Um, they, most of the time they just assume we're talking about adults. John Rawls' two big books were just saying, which of course we're only talking about adults. There was even a very influential book by Jack Donnelly called Universal Human Rights in Theory and Practice. That's, that's one of the main books that people read in classrooms about, about human rights. And this is not a pop quiz, but if you had to guess how many times children were mentioned, 
You can only be right if you said once <laughs> in 300 pages. Another strategy, <coughs> which is sort of basically the strategy of the children's rights movement, of the, of the sorry, childhood studies movement, and also it's a strategy of a, of, a, of a child liberation movement that began in the 70s in the wake of other liberation movements but never really built a lot of steam, um, is to say that children are equally human and deserve equal rights to adults in every possible way. Um, so um, just as other groups were previously excluded, we just need to tear down the barriers and, in, and include uh, children there as well. Um, and the basic, uh, the basic strategy here uh, is to sort of preserve the idea of rights as bequeathed by modernity and deny, simply deny that um, that, that, that doesn't apply to children. The children are equally agents as, as adults in society. And I have a lot of sympathy with that view. But I actually take a third kind of strategy, which goes like this. Uh, the strategy is to argue that the concept of human rights itself is too narrow and needs to be rethought and transformed and expanded. Um, it's, it's a little bit like perhaps the strategy in third wave feminism or queer theory or other post, post uh, colonial theory. To, is we want to remap the entire playing field and so on. And I think what I said earlier about theories is, is why, why I feel um, And there are figures like Sharda Balagapanan, uh, Barbara Bennett Woodhouse, Tom Cockburn, Ruth Lister, and others who are doing this. And, and this is what I'm doing as well. And what I call this in my work is um, childism. So my argument about uh, how to approach children's rights is that we have to take a childistic <coughs> approach. And by that, I simply mean uh, we need to think of them as, as, as empowering children, uh, as, as transforming the landscape in whatever way it has to happen, so that children find themselves equally empowered in, in our societies as adults. Age is not a determining factor uh, there. Um, so I actually wrote about this in an earlier book called Ethics in Light of Childhood, um, but in this book I wanted to try and apply it a little bit more. Um, I think what, what, what I, I guess I'm trying to say in essence is if you think about feminism, that's sort of what we need for children, uh, is a feminist, feminism for children, even though it might look a little bit different because of the different, a different group of people we're talking about. And what I conclude using this, this way of rethinking things is, first of all, descriptively, what children teach us is that humans are better understood not as socially independent persons, but as socially interdependent persons. So there's not two classes of humans divided through some kind of binary opposition of dependent, dependent children and some dependent adults and independent most adults. But this is a false opposition. Uh, we're, we're all interdependent on each other in many, many different kinds of ways on many different levels. Um, from family to community to nation, and especially globally, uh, we're deeply interconnected uh, with each other. We survive and thrive only through a vast network uh, of, of uh, social interconnections with each other. And so normatively, that yields a kind of concept of, of human rights overall, not just children's rights, as what I say here, it means of interdependent empowerment. And by that I mean rights exist to include everyone in the networks of relationships we form to, live, to, to, to create societies. So everybody deserves to be part of those networks and to be included in different forms, different ways in those relationships. <coughs> Everybody deserves to be part of a kind of dynamic com combination of supports, uh, agency, provision of resources, and the different elements that go into living interdependent lives with each other. So someone like Tazim Ali, for example, doesn't have to prove that he's independent or rational or not going to be spoiled in his innocence to have a voice uh, in his society. Um, on the contrary, whatever is required in his society for him to be uh, empowered as a member of that society 
whether that's education, social resources, or having a voice and being able to speak, is what he has a fundamental human right to have. Okay, so enough theory. Um, what about actual life, actuality? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say a few things about um, what I describe as historical ambiguities around children's rights. And the reason I use the word ambiguity is, is that at the actual history of children's rights over a roughly 200 year period has, has actually, in some sense, outstripped theory and pushed ahead of it and demanded things that children need. But on the other hand, um, the, the, it could be the theory or the culture or whatever it is has con nevertheless continued to weigh down children's rights um, and, and always kept children as second class citizens in, in one way or another. So there's advancing and, and falling back at the same time. Um, and I want to give you a, an example to think about, another one, um, which is from a, a book from a colleague of mine named Myra Bluebond Langner. This is an eight year old girl named Mary Costin who was dying of leukemia. Um, my, my colleague interviewed many children dying of leukemia, and what she discovered, to her surprise at the time, and to everybody's surprise, is that um, children uh, in that situation almost always know that they're dying of cancer, even as young as eight, even younger. And on top of that, collude with the idea that they don't know to protect their parents and their doctors. <clears throat> um, and so that dynamic um, suggests a lot of things about children's rights, and of course health rights around children are very complicated, but do children have rights to participate in, the, in health decisions in some ways? Um, do they have rights to knowledge about their health information, to equitable health resources, to protection from various forms of discrimination, including age discrimination, and of course many, many other, other things. So if we go back into history, we can unpack why, why all this is so complicated uh, for us today. And I've just simplified it by breaking it down into three waves. Um, a, a, history, a child saving wave, a child protection wave, and a child participation wave. wave. Um, and here's pop quiz number two. Does anybody know when children first, anybody under 18, first gained a legal right in the modern era? Or what it might have been too. What's that? Was it World War II? No, it was actually before that. Okay. World War I then? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there wasn't a World War Zero, so. <laughs> no, it, it actually goes back into the 19th century. It was, it was the very first time that I know of was in 1802, which was the Child Factory Act in the UK. And the, the very first Child Factory Act of 1802 said that children from 5 to 17 years old have to work in a clean and ventilated environment, receive an hour of daily education, monthly religious services, and work days of no longer than 12 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> so that was, a, that was an improvement over the previous situation. Um, of course, that gradually has tightened up over time. Um, it also got, throughout the 1800s, other kinds of similar sorts of saving rights, child saving rights were added, rights which are trying to save children from uh, terrible circumstances, basically. Uh, so you could, some people, you could include education rights in that, and the US was actually a leader in education rights. In, 18, in 1870, every US state guaranteed a free and universal elementary education, the first country in the world to do that. Um, and then other countries followed suit with other education rights. Um, Europe and North America started developing juvenile justice rights to save children from having to go into adult prisons and to rehabilitate instead of punish uh, children. And now we do get to World War I because all of this culminated in the 1924 League of Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Child, um, which had five rights and their they're now called provision kinds of rights. Um, I'm calling them child-saving kinds of rights, but rights to things like the means for normal development, 
very basic education, food, um, shelter, uh, that, sort, that sort of thing. Um, Eglantine Jet, uh, who also created and developed Save the Children, which is now one of the biggest NGOs in the world working with children, uh, was the one who actually wrote, drafted that um, declaration. And Kate Douglas Wigan, the American reformer, called it the right to a child. So it's child saving in that sense. Um, these are, theoretically speaking, sort of Lockean rights, that the rights to your self-interests being advanced in one way or another. But the, but the difference is that for adults and for Locke is that your interests are going to be advanced by adults, not by you yourself. But we're still folding children into this concept. Um, so it's a big step, that 100 year period, a lot happened for children's rights, going from zero to, to, to declar international declaration. It was actually more than the 2024 declaration was one of the first international declarations, actually. Um, but it's also ambiguous because um, it doesn't, uh, it, 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 children's rights are provided only according to the ideas and priorities of adults and without any input from children themselves, of course. But nevertheless, it's a step. After World War II, um, uh, I would date the next uh, wave, which would be child protection rights. Um, not that they didn't exist before, but the focus became how do you protect children from the kinds of public ravages that we saw children were, 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 could not be protected by their families from alone during World War II. So genocide, um, war, um, poverty, um, um, discrimination. Uh, turns out that these are not things you can just rely on the private home to, to keep children safe with. So you have to provide a public rights regime to protect children from those types of things. And this grew into the foundation of UNICEF in 1946, which initially took on a primarily protective but also provision rights uh, framework. Um, there was a 1959 Declaration on the Rights of the Child, uh, which was very similar to the 1924 one, but it added protections against discrimination um, and violence and cruelty and neglect and exploitation. So it, again, combined these saving and protecting kinds of rights. I think if you look at our country, um, you could point to um, Brown versus Board of Education, for example, um, in that middle picture where <coughs> Uh, in that decision, education came to be seen as not just something you have to provide, but something you have to protect children in so that they're not discriminated against. Um, and there's many other examples of, of these kind of things. Um, internationally, um, non-governmental organizations grew up uh, in spades to, to, to look at all kinds of issues like child prostitution, exploitative labor, sexual abuse, trafficking, um, you name it. Uh, one of the largest UN gatherings was the 1990 World Summer for Children, um, one of the largest gatherings of heads of state, who pledged a world declaration on the survival, protection, and development of children. So these kind of rights um, are, are the dominant children's rights, even today, I think. Uh, the, the idea, if you talk about what should children have rights to, but generally speaking, it comes down to yes, they need to be provided uh, uh, education and health and what have you, but mostly they need rights so that they're protected from violence and abuse uh, from, from the people around them. Um, but if you think about the, the example of Mary Coston, what does that mean? What does that mean for someone like her? It would, it would again be a little bit ambiguous because she would have the right to be protected from harm, she would have the right to health care. But again, she still would have no right to participate in her own care or in voicing her own concerns. So it was, it was that kind of concern that we've seen all along that led to a third wave of child participation kinds of rights. Um, and these gr did grow out of the, the, the civil rights movements of the 70s and, and efforts to apply to, to children some of those lessons. Um, it did grow out of the child and studies movement, which began in the 80s. And some of the early scholars in childhood studies were involved in drafting the, um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 
1989, but it was this Convention on the Rights of the Child that really kind of um, put this on the international agenda, the idea of children's participation in rights. And so this convention um, is, what is actually the most ratified treaty in all of human history. And I, don't know, I wonder if anyone knows what the one country is that didn't ratify it. I think you all probably do. United States. Know. Yes. <laughs> we can talk about why if you want later on. Um, lots of different reasons. But so among its, among its 40 different rights, six of them are what are often called participation rights or power rights or freedom rights or something like that. Rights to freedom of expression, rights to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, association and assembly, non-interference in family life or correspondence, and access to information. Um, so these uh, rights have spawned uh, this idea of participation rights, not only in the CRC, but afterwards, that was over 20 years ago now, almost, I guess almost, yeah, almost 30 years ago now, um, have spawned things like the Children's Parliament that Tazi Mali was involved in. Um, there are 30 countries with children's parliaments now. Yeah. Many cities have, ch have children's councils uh, run by children. Many countries have children's ministers who try to find what children's voices are. Um, it also has spawned child, la child labor unions around the world who are standing up for their rights to assemble and have their voices heard. Um, and lots of other developments like that. These are, these are basically Rousseauian kinds of rights that they're standing up for. Rights to form the general will that they're involved in. But, um, as I and others have argued, um, we're still, things are still ambiguous, uh, even though they've come a long way. Uh, what you have up here is the, part of the, the main participation right in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and it states that states' parties shall ensure the child who's capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child. The views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. That's a huge step forward historically um, compared to our other um, movements. But if you think about it, we still have things hemmed in on, on different sides. Um, we're saying, well, adults are going to decide if they're capable of doing this or not. Um, we're only going to let children express their views on matters affecting the child, not anybody else. Now, that's not what Tazi Mali was just doing. And we're only going to give due weight in accordance to their age and maturity, we being again adults. So it's really very far from um, international, and from full equal human rights. <laughs> With freedom of expression right there. <laughs> so, just as a silly little thing, if you substituted the word woman for child, first of all, you'd see that just saying child is actually rather uh, patronizing. Woman. But you would, nobody would tolerate that uh, if it was men or women who have to be curtailed in this country. So, um, how, do we, how do we start to move beyond this, his, these theoretical paradoxes and these historical ambiguities uh, around children's rights uh, in a more practical way uh, moving forward? Well, I want to give you three three different examples. Um, the first one being uh, labor rights. And I'm going to try and apply this idea of tribalism to, to, to children's labor rights uh, around the world. And let me give you another example uh, for this. Um, Gabriela Santos is a 12-year-old household shoe factory worker in Franca, Brazil, where a lot of shoes for America are made. She works eight hours a day in a household factory cutting and gluing shoes. Uh, she doesn't make much money. There are toxic fumes, and she attends school only a regular. But her family is so poor that she has to work to, to stave off starvation. Brazil outlawed all child labor under the age of 14, according to the International Labor Organization's edicts, um, and all industrial child labor of any kind under the age of 18. Um, but since so many children 
uh, field they need to work, the effect was to drive children into the kind of factory that Santos is in, which is a household factory outside the, the public realm. Does anyone know how many children under 18 work in exploitative labor conditions around the world? This is a hard one. Well, it's about, it, there's many different estimates, but the ILO estimates is five and a half million. Other people have much higher estimates, but of course it depends on what you mean by exploitation in labor. Um, well, um, about half of the world's exploited laborers are, laborers are actually children. Uh, people under the age of 18, anyway, children or youth, as opposed to there being a third of the population. Um, we probably are beneficiaries of children's exploited labor. Uh, this computer, I won't mention my own computer, uh, my shirt, you know, uh, your breakfast cereal. Uh, uh, you can't know, of course, but this, this, I, I can't tell you with 99% certainty that you have benefited from child, child labor, ex exploitative child labor, not just child labor. So you're a rotten group of people, basically, you know, but I am too, so you know, it's, it's, it's the way the world is. Um, so, how has the international rights community tried to deal with this? Um, well, the ILO uh, set a 1973 minimum age convention that said all labor under 15 uh, is exploitative by definition and shouldn't be, shouldn't happen, uh, not, not paid labor. Uh, the, the ILO's international labor organization's worst forms of child labor convention in 1999 bans any child labor that's exploitative or likely to harm the child's health, safety, or morals. But none of this has been extremely effective. There, there have been some reductions in, in children's exploitative labor, but they're not great reductions. They're up against the tide of globalization, where the ability to exploit children for labor is, is getting easier and easier. And the national laws become less, less strong, and global products become much further removed from people who buy them. Um, and they're also up against uh, global poverty, where many children really do just have to work uh, in one way or another. Um, so uh, it, it, there's a little bit of an irony here, though, because, of course, children's laboring is actually one form of evidence that they have agency and voice and ca capacities to act in the world. So to then use that to say they don't, they shouldn't, is, is a little bit ironic. Um, but on the other hand, exploitative labor may be problematic as well. So I think childism would suggest that uh, labor rights shouldn't be based on an artificial distinction between independent adults and dependent children. Um, they should be based on the idea that we, we, everybody needs to be included in one way or another in an interdependent economy, whether that's local, national, or global. But that we depend on each other and we also participate at the same time, and that's just the human condition. That would suggest that um, you need a balance of uh, dependent provision for economic support and protections against uh, discrimination and exploitation with independent participation in, in some form of labor economy, if necessary or appropriate. And as children themselves, have argued, as you can see from these um, uh, child union posters uh, from Latin America. Um, the, the, when the ILO tries to impose a kind of bourgeois idea of children is not working, it drives children into exploitative conditions. And what would be a better solution that these young people have come up with is to be able to work, uh, but with dignity and without being exploited. Um, most famously, this happened in Bolivia, where Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, was himself a child, a laborer. And uh, they ultimately passed a law against the international community's will to allow um, uh, children to work, part, uh, to labor, but part time, down to the age of 10. Um, so that's one example. Um, how do you think about labor rights in, in, a, in a way that includes the, the, the experiences and concerns of many children around the world? Uh, another example is voting rights. 
this is perhaps more, more controversial, but one of the things I argue for in this book is that um, basically children should have the right to vote. Um, I wonder if anybody knows here, this is the, pop, this is the last pop quiz, I, I swear, um, where and when 18 year olds first got the right to vote. Okay, in the US, it was 1971, yes, the 26th Amendment. But we actually were uh, behind uh, other places. It was actually 1946 in Czechoslovakia was the very first time. And many European countries then followed suit, and we, for various reasons, having partly to do with the Vietnam War, decided to lower the voting age from 21 to, to 18. So actually, um, it's very recently in history that um, the voting age has been lower than 21 anywhere, and it's still 21 in some places. Um, but what this chart does, which I made, um, so I don't know how accurate it is, but um, it, it tries to lay out sort of how, the vote, how modern voting rights are not counted in ancient India and Greece and Rome or anything like that, but the, the modern idea of voting rights began, and you can chart it back to the, the first English council in 1066 when nobility and clergy were given the right to essentially veto the king's edicts because the conquering king from France wanted them on board, so that's why he did that. Um, and there's a long flat line of property only white men getting the right to vote, which of course takes you all the way up to the foundation of our own country and the French Revolution. Um, and um, what's interesting about that is that the, the meaning of voting then had to change when it's not just an ability but property owners. Why, why property owners? Well, I think it had the it was the idea that if you you're representing your community, if you're a property owner, you're the person in position to stand for what your local community might want. Well, then we move to other white men, 21 and older, regardless of if they have property. So, what, how does that change the meaning of the right to vote? I guess now you're representing maybe your family or something like that. I'm not sure how to interpret that. When you then move into uh, non-white men, 21 and older, getting right, starting to get the rights to vote, um, what, do you, what does that mean? Um, maybe it's the same thing, just without being discriminatory about it, or maybe it's a recognition that to have a, a true electorate, a true democracy, you need to have diversity of voices. I don't know. Um, and then, of course, we start getting um, women's rights to vote, all these women over the age of 21. Um, starting in the late 1800s. Uh, and <clears throat> there, a, that's, that's a pretty radical shift, because now you're not saying somebody can represent your family in politics. You're saying that every individual adult has the ability to represent themselves uh, in politics. So you come down to the individual level of, of political rights. And so, What's, what's actually happening now is, as you may have heard, uh, there are lots of movements for 16-year-olds to get the right to vote around the world. There are actually 13 co entire countries around the world that have a 16-year-old vote. Um, one of them, for example, is Brazil, where voting is actually mandatory. Um, although, I think it's only mandatory at 18, but you have the right to vote at 60. Um, there, are, there are actually four cities in the U US that now have local rights to vote for 16 months. They're all in America for some reason. It's contagious or something, so they'll be coming here soon. Um, and there was a German, the German parliament in 2008, I talk about this in my book, actually passed a resolution to um, provide the voting aid, provide the vote for everyone when they're born, if they're a German citizen, and for parents to uh, uh, exercise that right on their children's behalf until the, they decide the child can, can exercise it for themselves. Uh, so my, my uh, argument is that um, the only way to really have a proper democracy um, where you're actually representing all the people instead of just two-thirds of the people um, is to change again what voting means. 
add another layer, not just to the graph, but to the meaning of voting itself in the first place. And I, I call that, that, that layer a proxy claim vote, which I get into trouble for with my child studies colleagues who have a more liberationist idea. They just want to give everybody the vote and be done with it. I don't think that's a good idea because I think you're simply taking the old idea and clumping children into it. And, in, and if you did that, you would have people like three-year-olds or babies who wouldn't be voting and they would be even more marginalized than they are today. Um, so I think that what we should do is grant the vote to everybody, every citizen at least, at, at home first, and allow a parent or guardian to use that on their behalf, and also grant a similar kind of proxy vote to any adult who isn't able to exercise it on their own behalf. Let's say they have severe dementia. Let's say they have a serious illness. Um, let's say they have serious mental health issues. I don't agree with this, but let's say in this country they're in prison and have had their vote taken away. I think they should have their vote in prison, but of course they often don't, so there you can add that as well. But I would include adults under this uh, umbrella of a proxy vote if, um, if, if necessary, if, if the adult wants someone else to do that. But then the claim part is that and this is different from the German parliament model. Anybody can claim their own vote for themselves whenever they want. And my view is that the act of claiming your right to vote is sufficient evidence of your ability to vote. It suggests you know what voting is, and you know what it's for, and you want to do it. And democracy should have the lowest minimum criteria for voting, not the most high. So I think if we did this, what we, what we would hopefully find is um, children's concerns would be much more central to our political life. Um, they would probably get health care, uh, universal health care, like the, the, elder, the other end of the spectrum we can't work at. Um, but many other things that we can't predict. I think how would schools be transformed through, through this? Or how would communities be changed? Um, what kind of resources would go to, 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 to areas of life that are very important to children that have always been um, left out and forgot, forgotten about, perhaps. Um, and so theoretically, what we're doing here is we're saying that voting is not a, a, the process of an individual independently deciding what they think is good for either them or their society, but we're recognizing our interdependency, that there are members of society who depend on other people for political power but they can also claim that, yeah, in, they, they, they can undo that dependency by claiming the vote for themselves. So that's what I think democracy needs, and that's kind of a crazy idea in some, in some ways. And just lastly, um, just, I just want to say a couple of things, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, about uh, the situation this summer with uh, refugee rights in the southern world. Um, uh, this is not in my book. Um, this is new work that I'm doing, but um, uh, it just raises, you know, obviously very troubling, but very peculiar questions when you're someone who works in children's rights. How, how could this have happened, basically? It's a question I'm, I'm struggling with. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, um, uh, through the Attorney General's uh, zero tolerance policy in April, there ended up being 2,654 minors as young as eight months old separated from their parents and put in detention facilities um, under the Flores decree that uh, you, you can't detain children with adults, um, but if we're going to now detain families, that means we have to detain children separately. Um, we don't have to get into the, the legal back and forth that happened over that, but um, um, I'm sure you're all aware of, of, of all of that. Um, interestingly, the, the Mrs. L. B. Ice um, uh, class action lawsuit by the, the American Civil Liberties Union argued uh, successfully that this was uh, unjust based on due process. Reasons that separating, you can't just take people from their families. 
<coughs> especially of dead children. Um, you, you can't separate children from families unless it's in the best interest of the child to do so, which in this case it clearly wasn't. Um, on the contrary, it seemed to have been done as a deterrence for other families, not, not to come. <coughs> anyway, so um, I, I, I looked into the international children's rights around this question, and it's interesting when you try to apply a convention on the rights of the child, which of course we haven't ratified, or the other commandments that we have, um, it breaks down into, into sort of three different components. Um, one of them is this due process component, um, where things like the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights says no one should be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. Or the 1951 Convention related to the status of refugees that the US is a signatory to or a party to says, states shall not impose penalties on account of their illegal entry or presence on refugees who enter or are present in the territory without authorization, provided they present themselves without delay to the authorities and show good cause for their illegal entry or presence. In other words, we, we shouldn't criminalize uh, refugees for coming across the border illegally in a sense. Um, there's a lot of international law about separation from families not just for children, but especially for children. Um, the 1966 Co uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says the family is a natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by the society and the state. Um, and then and the other category, the third category I would put in is, is cruel or abusive treatment. Um, and some have argued that we're actually talking about torture. Uh, here, because the, the 1987 Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment defines torture as follows. It includes any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted by a state party on a person for such purposes as punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed or intimidating or coercing him or a third person. A special rapporteur's group made the argument that, that this, some of this is torture. Um, well, what can um, a children's rights perspective add to this? There's obviously many different ways to look at it, um, psychological perspective of trauma and so on. Um, well, I think when it's a, a childistic kind of children's rights framework, you can say uh, a couple of things. You know, one of them is that the problem is that children are being treated as the, the, the property of their parents, <coughs> objects to be used to punish uh, parents or adults in, in general, or the property of the state to, to advance its policies regardless of the actual human rights of the individuals involved. Um, so that's a way in which children are not understood, understood to have full human rights as children. But I also think we can say that um, uh, refugee children and refugee adults are, are a clear demonstration in a way of the interdependency of, of human lives. Um, you're, you're coming to a place in a very vulnerable state and um, the human condition is such that you, especially as a child, need to be with your family in, in that situation. That, that that's part of your, you have a right not to be separated from your family because you're not just an individual autonomous person, you're someone who has interdependencies with other groups. And for me, in some ways, that's what was for, that's what got lost in the shuffle. Uh, the idea that um, treating children with, as, as people with human rights means recognizing that kind of level of, of, of interdependence. So I'm sure we can talk a lot more about that issue uh, as well. But just to conclude, uh, overall, um, I just want to suggest that including the youngest third of humanity is, is a very important uh, challenge for the, 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 ch the human rights movement as where it is today. Um, and um, we need to understand it as uh, a challenge to, on the one hand, the, the deeply adultistic history and, and theoretical groundwork behind human rights in the first place. 
but also on the other hand an, an opportunity to think creatively about um, what human rights are and, and how they should function. But one way or another, children's rights are human rights and that needs to be accounted.